Okay, thank you for joining us. This is uh, Alliance Bentronic Seminar number 90. Uh, the speaker today is Dr. Hendrik Goldak um, from the Advanced Light Source. He will talk about visualizing spin currents with X-ray microscopy. So I look forward to the talk. Um, Dr. Oldag is a staff scientist at the Advanced Light Source at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. He graduated from the University of Düsseldorf in 2002 with a doctorate in experimental physics uh, when he studied exchange bias using X-ray spectral microscopy. Um, during his PhD, he spent two years as a research assistant and visiting scientist at the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory in Stanford and uh, at LBNL. And um, after a postdoc appointment at SLAC, he became a staff scientist at the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source. In 2018, he uh, moved across the San Francisco Bay to join the ALS in Berkeley as a staff member. Um, his research, research focuses on X-ray microscopy of magnetic materials with a focus on time result studies. Uh, he is also an adjunct professor in material science and engineering at Stanford and in physics at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He has been a distinguished lecturer for the IEEE Magnetic Society in 2017, and he is also a fellow of the American uh, Physical Society. Um, so with this, I'll hand it over to you, Hendrik, please uh, take it from here. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Carol, and uh, also thank you, uh, Jin, for, for uh, inviting me today to give the talk in uh, this wonderful seminar that's running for so long now already and has uh, kept us busy through the pandemic over the last two years. Um, what I would like to talk to you is about visually, how to visualize spin currents with X-ray microscopy. Um, and so that the talk will be essentially um, structured into two parts or after a short introduction. Um, I will at first review a little bit about what we have done in the area of spin injection and transfer. And so there are some, some more um, uh, uh, um, uh, first results that we obtained a couple of years ago about how to image spin injection from a ferromagnet into a non-magnet and how to um, uh, image what, what happens then uh, in a second ferromagnet uh, when that spin uh, current is injected into the second ferromagnet. And then I will go to uh, in the second part um, a little bit more um, recent results, talk about a little bit about spin pumping and uh, dynamic spin transfer. And then at the end, um, essentially as a microscopist, you have the advantage, you can always show like nice images and, and do fascinating stuff on the nanoscale. So we'll talk a little bit about how, what we're doing uh, to image X -ray, uh, spin waves, and in particular spin waves and bacterial switches. Um, so my background is, uh, or our background of our group here is down here in the Silicon Valley. Uh, as we were always very interested in, in how fundamental science can lead to new devices and new technologies. Um, and so one of the things that, that I always like to start my talk with, because it's, it's, it so nicely shows what really how fundamental science has um, entered the world of engineering and technology and so on, is, is when you think about hardware, a hard drive of storage, although nobody's using hard drives these days anymore. But I mean, the first hard drive in 1956 was the IBM Ramac. Um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a huge instrument, a thousand uh, kilograms, a ton of, of metal. You could rent it for like $30,000 a month, five megabytes. I mean, essentially two songs, uh, two MP3 songs that you could, could get on this thing. Uh, and just 60 years further, uh, and here I have an an image from 2016, it's a five terabyte hard drive and you can get them much bigger now these days uh, already. It just it fits the palm of your hand. And the reason why this is possible is that because of the way we engineer new devices, we engineer new technology has completely changed. I mean, in the 50s, you had materials that would put these materials together in a way so that you can actually achieve the, the performance that you wanted to. But nowadays we, we engineering the materials. Uh, and so to engineer the materials, we need to have methods to characterize these materials on the nanoscale, uh, look below the surface, characterize interfaces, characterize uh, the, the dynamic properties of these materials uh, on, the, um, on very fast timescales. And that's exactly where X-rays come in because X-rays have that ability to look on femtosecond, picosecond timescales and look at the nanoscale because of their wavelengths. 
and so <clears throat> just to 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 uh, reiterate this actually um, the the way we, we we achieve all these um properties on the nanoscale is really by looking at different um different types of nanoscales either a lateral nanoscale by by by, by self assembly of nanoparticles by lateral nanostructure and so on and so on uh, but we also have a perpendicular nanoscale and that's exactly an interfix so uh, nowadays uh, every everything we do for the last 20 years essentially is multilayers so magnetic multilayers and then lots of uh, things that happen in multilayers happen at the interface and so that is a nanoscale by itself and also very often uh, and but I will not talk about this today is actually you, you have a material in, in plant um, atoms at the right uh, um, density, at the right spots. And so this is how you design your materials. But anyway, so this is actually, if you think about um, all these kind of different nanoscales that are important nowadays to really to be able to characterize it, you need to have a tool that allows you to do that. And that's exactly what X-ray microscopy does. Um, and um, X-ray microscopy essentially has been pioneered uh, very early on, um, already or more than 100 years ago by not run good. Uh, although it wasn't really a microscope in that sense, it just it, the, the ability to use x-rays to look through things and to, to, to discover bone structures in your, in your body and so on, um, that really has fascinated people. It took about 100 years really to take x-ray microscopy or x-ray imaging to the next level and, and employ it uh, onto magnetic systems. And the, the second image here is essentially domain structure from a hard drive. Uh, as um, taken with a PIM microscope at the Advanced Lights was in 1995. All, but only 10 years later, we were already uh, able to uh, image in three dimensions, meaning so you could have a ferromagne uh, ferromagnetic interferometric bilayer with an interface in between um, and uh, discover the interferomagnetic as well as, as well as the ferromagnetic domain structure and uh, identify what's happening in, in between. And again, this is the see-through vision and, and the, uh, the, the ability of X-rays to do that. <clears throat> And now finally, and this, this is something that I will cover today, my talk mostly is the time structure. We will talk about this uh, a little bit more. And uh, Peter Fischer and myself, we have uh, uh, written a little uh, uh, report on this in the progress of physics a couple of years ago that, that summarizes most of these uh, uh, accomplishments. So what's, so it, what's the most important thing about X-ray microscopy is that you not only that you have this see-through visions, which allows you to penetrate the materials and look through it and the lens scale so that you have nanometer wavelengths, which means you can resolve nanometer objects, but you have an elemental and chemical sensitivity. And that's probably the most important thing um, here because X-ray microscopy is a little bit more complex than the regular microscopy. You need to go to a synchrotron, there's a lot of effort involved, but really what you gain here is that this elemental sensitivity because the absorption of X-rays um, is, is enhanced when you hit these absorption resonances where you uh, excite core level electrons into final states here. And so these uh, happen at characteristic energies where the absorption is, incre is increased significantly. And it's also because these the density of states up here, uh, the valence states really depend on um, the chemical environment. You not only can distinguish between elements by choosing your photon energy, you can also choose, uh, look at the chemistry. And that's very important in particular when you think about uh, uh, chemical interfaces and complex metal oxide structures, where you can then distinguish between of pure metal or whether these interfaces are slightly oxidized, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the polarization dependence of the X-ray absorption cross-section is something that we use a lot, and we use it a lot for, um, uh, for the magnetic microscopy. And that essentially means it's very much like Kerr effect um, in the visible range. Uh, when you have a circular polarization, you will find that with uh, a, a certain circular helicity, of positive, let's say positive helicity, you only excite spin up. Uh, spin up electrons into spin up final states with negative helicity, you preferably uh, have the other excitation. And in a ferromagnet, that means you get a different absorption cross section for the, for the different helicities because you have more spin up than spin down electrons in your uh, um, uh, close to the Fermi edge. And that also means you have more spin up than spin down or more spin down than spin up uh, holes in this case. So this um, uh, asymmetry between the two polarizations, that's referred to as extra magnetic circular dichroism. And the nice thing about it, it's usually very large effect. So pure iron has a, has a, has a dichroism effect of like almost 50%, um, meaning you get a very strong, um, a very strong uh, contrast mechanism here to image mag magnetization, which makes it, again, a very nice technique to, for, to, uh, image, uh, to address uh, magnetism. Um, okay, so... And over the years, 
a lot of different uh, uh, microscopy techniques have developed, uh, have been developed uh, over the last 20, 25 years. Um, photo emission electron microscope has been very popular for a long time. Um, this is where you uh, excite, uh, where you shine light on your X-rays on your sample, and then you collect all the photo, ele um, photo electrons and secondary electrons that are emitted uh, from your sample. And using a regular electron microscope, then you can get very nice images of the surface. Um, then there's the regular transmission X-ray microscope, which almost works like a like a standard. Um, um, optical microscope in that sense that, that you have two lenses, one to illuminate the sample, one to image the sample. Um, uh, and ever since uh, we, the, the technology has been such that we can actually make X-ray lenses using Fresnel zone plates uh, very efficiently, that is a technique that has been taken, uh, that has been very popular. And Peter Fisher is one of the uh, people who is really pushing this technique a lot um, and has done a lot of great work in the last 20 years. Um, on, on our in, in our expertise is uh, scanning transmission X-ray microscope. It's also a photon in, photon out technique. So, but you, here you only have one lens. Uh, you have uh, X-rays shining onto your sample. You have the lens making a very small focus. That depends on the optics, can be 15, can be 25, can be 50 nanometer. That's, that's pretty much the range that we are looking at. And then you have a detector on the back. That's That detector is not a camera, it's really just a diode that measures how many photons get transmitted through the sample. And then you scan your sample through that um, through that beam. So it's like any other AFM, uh, MFM technique, but not with a probe, with a physical probe, but with an X-ray beam, with a small X-ray beam. Um, the advantage here really, of what's nice about it, again, all the contrast mechanisms are at your avail, um, that you can chemical, magnetic, and so on and so on. Um, but also, um, since you're measuring photon in, photon out, Photons are not affected by external stimuli, by fields, et cetera. So we can apply field pulses, we can apply electric pulses, and so on and so on. And that really doesn't uh, affect the, the quality of the image other than in an electron microscope, for example. Um, and since the synchrotron that we're using is a pulsed source, so typically we get a short X-ray pulse, tens of picoseconds every two nanoseconds. Um, it, you can, it really lends itself to any kind of pump probe microscopy. And the time scales that you can reach, tens of picoseconds, again, is very uh, uh, convenient for, for magnetism studies. Okay, so the first part of the, uh, with, with that introduction, I would like to uh, switch over to uh, talk a little bit about a couple of scientific examples. And um, so when we, um, about 10 years ago, uh, we built such a, Fix a microscope at the uh, Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source that had the ability to do uh, time resolve measurements in a pump probe uh, scheme. Um, and uh, I don't want to go too much into details, but there's an electronic here where, where we have a development electronic that essentially allowed us to uh, detect single pulses coming from the synchrotron and then monitor how the transmission through the sample at a, diff 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 a particular point changes with a magnetic excitation with an electric excitation also on, uh, and, and looking at the different delays. So by, by being able to, to change the delay between excitation and um, and detection. So a classical pump probe uh, scheme uh, with, again, 20, 30, 40 nanometer resolution. So what we were interested in, and, and that's the, the really the, the question that drove our group at the time, and uh, at the time in Stanford, I was in, in the group of uh, Joe Stir, um, is can we really see how a current driven from a ferromagnet into a non-magnet changes or introduces a magnetization in the non-magnet. Again, when you when you have an element-specific probe, and for example, look look at the picture down here on the left. You have a ferromagnet that may be copper, permalloy, whatever, what have you. Um, uh, oh, sorry, cobalt, permalloy, or what have you. Um, so now you have a magnetization here. You drive a current. That the current has a certain spin polarization. Now, once that current enters the copper, you essentially expect there right at the interface and, and uh, at a certain distance from the interface for that spin polarization to, to persist. Um, and uh, uh, in certain elements with a very long spin decay lens like gallium arsenide and so on, we have seen this with MOOC. Um, so we set out to do this in, in copper. Can we see how a driving a current from a ferromagnet into a non-magnet turns a non-magnet ferromagnetic or turns, turns a magnetization on in, in, in a, in a non-magnet? And so that would be essentially the, the first experiment. So you have a polarizing ferromagnet, you arrive a current into the non-magnet, you look at the return current. And so you look at with XMCD, in this case, XMCD of copper, can we see that um, how, we, uh, uh, how we turn this into a ferromagnet? And then the next steps would be, okay, so if we have that, 
um, then we can excite all kinds of dynamics and, and effects in a second ferromagnet. And uh, because that spin current now exerts a, a spin torque um, in the second ferromagnet and excites spin waves and so on and so on. These are things that you can see or that you can actually characterize with lots of different methods uh, using magnetic resistive effects and transport measurements and so on. What we really were out to, can we see what's happening? I mean, because it's, it's, it's always stiff. I mean, um, oh, I would say if, if you see something on the on the nanoscale, you, you typically always have some sort of um, um, additional insight how the how the the, the heterogeneity of, of the excitation and so on um, that that you haven't thought about before, and so there's always additional information that you can learn from that. So, and again, this is uh, where X-ray microscopy really comes in very nicely um, by by being able to do this to, to look at the dynamics on the nanoscale. So. Um, so these are now a little bit, uh, these were our first results of the, of the next couple of slides that I just want to, to, to summarize here because they really give a very nice introduction of what's possible with that technique. Um, we started, um, that, that's, that, that project also started probably more than 10 years ago by now, um, and it really took us a long time because that, that induced magnetization in copper is very small, so we really had to play a lot of tricks here to, to, to see that. Um, but we started with a sample that was made by Jordan Cartin at HGST when HGST was still around. Um, so essentially we had our, our sample on a silicon uh, substrate, that silicon substrate underneath the sample is thinned and uh, it's a silicon nitride substrate so that you can actually look through it uh, with x-rays. And so then now we can drove, drive a current through this, through our sample. And so the sample is a cobalt palladium multilayer um, that's grown by Andy Kenskub and by you. And so that cobalt palladium multilayer has a perpendicular anisotropy. And um, so we can now drive a current through this into the copper. And the copper was a 20 to 50, the different copper samples, a 20 to 50 nanometer thick. And the idea is now essentially using our setup that allows us to do a very fast lock in uh, technique uh, that, um, that is synchronized with the synchrotron, with the synchrotron ex, uh, with, uh, excitation, we can now detect these very small changes in the X-ray absorption in the copper on the 200, on this lens scale of 250 nanometer and see how the copper becomes magnetic or, 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 or um, um, becomes magnetic. So, and so what I'm showing you here are, the, are these results that we obtained. Uh, so this is an image of that nanopillar um, that's, a, that's the contact, that's 250 nanometer in diameter. And so now we're taking line scans across this area and we're taking line scans by comparing with the current through, uh, with the current on and the current off. And the, the current on with the current off means magnetism on, magnetism off in the copper. And so we monitor the transmission to the copper, the X-ray transmission to the copper. And that small change in X-ray transmission is then due to the magnetization of the couple. And we see that we have a very small uh, variation here of the order of 10 to the minus five, a few times 10 to the minus five. And so um, that we can correlate to, to, to a moment in, in, the, in the copper. And we find that this spin injection leads to a moment of the order of five times 10 to the minus five core magnetron. And we do this with opposite polarization. So we do this with circ plus circular polarized light and we see an increase in transmission. And with negative subpolarized light, we see a decrease in transmission. With these small effects, you always have to make sure that you can switch the polarization and make sure that what you see is really a magnetic effect. So that we were very excited by this, but it was really like uh, 10 years of, year, uh, of work uh, culminated in, in, in these experiments. But we found something very surprising, something that was very surprising to us. Now, if we monitor the size of this XMCD effect, of this difference with energy, what we found is that actually we don't have just a regular um, spectrum with one peak. We find an XMCD spectrum that has two peaks. And the first peak is here at this energy and the second peak is at this energy. And now the gray line through here is, is essentially is the, the copper absorption spectrum. And what we find is that these two peaks um, are correlated with different electronic states in the copper. The first peak here is right, sitting right on the infection point of the copper absorption edge, and that is uh, the Fermi edge. So these are conduction electrons, really. That's, that's the bank. That XMCD is caused by the magnetization, spin polarization of conduction electrons going from, uh, traveling from cobalt into copper and through copper. That second peak here is related to um, electrons or electronic states that are chemically hybridized between copper and cobalt, right at the interface. So what this means is when you inject the spin polarization now from the cobalt into the copper, 
um, that at first you kind of magnetize the interface. You're losing, so to speak, a lot of uh, spin polarization right at the interface. And then um, the rest of the, the remaining part of the spin polarization then enters the, the cobalt a copper and travels uh, further down. So that was actually new to us that we could that we uh, that we have the sensitivity not only to just see which we would have made us very happy see that spin polarization uh, that, that magnetic moment in the copper but that we also have the sensitivity that we can distinguish between uh, the participation of different electronic states at the interface and in the bulk of the copper. Okay, so. Now, uh, I want to show you two quick examples how we can use these spin currents or what we have done in, uh, following these experiments using these spin currents um, uh, to, to excite dynamics and to strike spin waves and, and things like that. Um, and um, I just want to, I can skip the slide because I think most of you are very much aware of how this works. So we had, we were looking at two different arrangements. Um, oh, or maybe I should actually go back. So, the thing is that what, what fascinated us is that um, when you do these, these uh, spin talk os uh, oscillations and you look at these, these dynamics here um, generated by spin currents, that you, have, that you can have very different uh, dynamics that you excite. You can either have like, local dynamics where you just have uh, a, a, really a local excitation at the, at the, pl the place of the, um, uh, uh, of, the, of the injection, but you can also have like spin waves that travel and, and that, that extend all the way of uh, microns or hundreds of nanometers at least from uh, the uh, from the injection point. So we wanted to, and this depends very much on the local geometry. And we wanted to see if we can can we get some can get some information on the nanoscale what happens when and can we see these different kinds of excitations. So we started with um, with with uh, Andy Kent together, uh, Andy Kent's group together, and NYU together. We started uh, on an experiment where we just had uh, cobalt palladium, uh, sorry, no uh, cobalt nickel PMA layer. On top, um, uh, uh, on top of a, of, a, of a pillar, and so here we um, uh, and um, we we had a little um, permanent magnet that allowed us to apply up to 0.7 tesla to that system, which then also allowed to have the polarizer, the polarizing layer, magnetized all the way along the, the axis. So we really have this this perpendicular alignment, and everything is out of play. And um, when you when, we, when, you, when they did the electronic measurements, they essentially found that up to 29 milliamps, and this is a, a, now I have to remember, it's about 100 nanometer, 100, no, 150 nanometer um, um, uh, uh, contact here. Um, up to 29 uh, milliamps, there's nothing really happening. Uh, uh, they don't see any excitation. Um, but then at 30 milliamps, we see what's coming up is, is the same like a little bit of magnetic contrast right on top of the of the injection point, right on top of the, of the pillar. Um, and it doesn't really change a lot if we go now up in, in current. Um, so nothing really happens at around 30 milliamps, that excitation happens, uh, that, that excitation appears, and we see it persisting up to uh, higher uh, currents. And it's really, it's again, it's a true magnetic excitation because when we reverse the polarization, uh, we see that uh, the, the contrast reverses, so it's a true XMCD. So we did this all the way up to 34 milliamps and the contrast really didn't change a lot. Uh, it, it didn't change its size, definitely. Um, and also it's, it's always very nicely located, co-located with the, with the uh, contact. So what this really is, is, is when, we, when we discussed this, uh, we figured out this really fits very nicely the, um, uh, the description and the behavior of a localized magnetic excitation. Um, and, and it's really, we try to, we, we try to fit it, uh, that excitation, and it doesn't really, it doesn't at all uh, fit with, uh, with any kind of extended um, excitation that we may miss here. It's, it's uh, all the excitation is, or all the magnetic contrast is, is um, co-located with, uh, with the contact um, and the line profile here, is, it's also 175 nanometers and 150 nanometer um, contract. So that's, that's that is um, um, that is very nice conclusive that this is really like a coherent excitation of the entire magnetization. So you can imagine you have all the um, spins on without without the current. You have all the spins pointing up. Now once you run the current, all the spins on top of the uh, contact start to rotate coherently with each other, and that's exactly what we see here. Um, so by, when they do this, the, the, the total magnetization uh, along the axis 
uh, is reduced a little bit, and that's exactly what we pick up at as an XMCD contrast. Okay, so <clears throat> when we now uh, have a, a now Stefano Bonetti at the time, who was a postdoc in our group, um, then went ahead and he was interested in what happens in the planar alignment. Uh, so when we have a, um, uh, for example, here five nanometer permalloy layer, um, and it's a cobalt iron. Uh, um, uh, polarizer. Um, so now nothing that we don't need a very large field. We only needed about 70 Ersted, um, 700 Ersted here uh, to, uh, to keep uh, the magnetization in, in one direction. <clears throat> and now if we, if we run, if we, um, if we um, excite the system just right, uh, we actually see a very nice, a very nice dynamics evolve at about 6.2 uh, gigahertz. So 6.2 gigahertz meaning uh, a full revelation of the uh, of um, of the magnetization takes about 160 picoseconds, and what you see here is, is a, essentially a movie how we image the magnetization over the 560 picoseconds, and we just uh, uh, play this in a loop. And what surprised us very much at the uh, when we saw this is that here and this little uh, black uh, ellipse that I'm showing here is the position of the contact, so where we inject the the spin um, the, the the current. From the cobalt iron into the permalloy, um, that now we have lots of excitations going on everywhere apart from um, away from the contrast, and we have this non-homogeneous uh, spin wave, uh, non-homogeneous excitation that re resembles that of a uh, of a spin wave with p-symmetry here um, going away from the contrast uh, from the contact. And um, I don't want to go too much into details here, so we we'll have a little bit more time for the other things as well. But what, what really what was happening here is that uh, we have these dynamics that are driven not only by the external fields, but also driven by the bursted fields. And that's because all of these on the nanoscales now, everything is very uh, closely together. Uh, the cobalt iron down here is, is, a, is essentially a big permanent magnet that's right next to the free amyloid that has a big uh, field. And that all defines the energy landscape here in the free layer. And that free and the energy landscape is not homogeneous anymore, it's heterogeneous. And that leads to this very uh, um, directed uh, emission of a spin wave. Okay, and just uh, to summarize this part is, um, as you can see, um, these were the three problems we set out to, to solve at the beginning, again, by, by now, uh, this is almost 10 years ago. And we were very uh, uh, happy or very uh, uh, lucky uh, that we found great uh, uh, collaborators to, to, to do this, and uh, um, uh, that, that culminated then in a couple of papers a couple of years ago. Now, our next step would be now to go a little bit away from the static spin injection, because the one thing we, have, we saw with all these samples is uh, when you do static spin injection, you really need very high current densities, and uh, very often samples would break. At, at the end of the day, they're very small spin polarizations and small effects. Um, so it's five times 10 minus five, so that's really not, not a lot. Um, uh, so um, we wanted to go away from that and, and want to look at a dynamic spin injection and spin pumping. And with, with a group of Alex Hoffman, uh, a couple of years ago, we, 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 uh, we just, um, thought about the following experiment. Uh, so they had, um, um, they made this little uh, coplanar waveguide uh, where and the, the coplanar waveguide again was made from copper. And so now that we have the little permalloy stripes on the, on the middle uh, electrode of that coplanar wave waveguide. And uh, when you hit the right frequency, uh, what happens is that the permalloy, uh, right frequency and field combination, the permalloy goes into resonance, the, it starts to oscillate. <clears throat> and now you have two components. Uh, essentially, you have an AC component uh, of the of the resonation of, uh, of the um, um, of the magnetization, and you have a DC component of the magnetization because you essentially you shorten again the effective magnetization along one direction, and both of them get injected into the copper, this AC and the DC component. And so we are first looking at the DC component whether we can see this by essentially just imaging, uh, bringing the the permalloy into resonance, imaging the system, and and, and again uh, turning it off and on, off and on, and looking at the difference between these two images. And so they pre-characterized their samples in the lab, and they found that uh, at about 150 euros that uh, they have a resonance at about 4.9 gigahertz. Uh, what's more important is that they found this very nice behavior of one resonant essentially increasing uh, with frequency when they increase the field. Now, when we do the same thing now in the microscope, and we look at the magnetization, how the magnetization develops when we increase the, the frequency, is the following. At, 
without any field, we just see the, the, the wave guide. So that's uh, the cobalt. It's a little bit darker in the middle. That's where the permalloy is. So it's more material. It's thicker, so it's darker. Now, once we hit four gigahertz, we start picking up a little bit of magnetization signal because of magnetic, uh, the magnetic susceptibility that we have essentially see. At 4.5 gigahertz, there's a pretty strong XMCD signal coming from the, uh, from the copper right underneath the permalloy. And actually, that signal is fairly large. It's, it's, it's about 20 times larger than using uh, static spin injection. But it was also at a slightly lower frequency of what we, were, what we uh, expected. However, if you go to 4.9 gigahertz, where we expected, we still see, a, see an excitation. But that excitation is not homogeneous uh, spatially anymore. Now it becomes uh, a heterogeneous. So we have like lots of uh, excitation on the, on the edges, but very little in the middle. So essentially, we, when we now monitor the XMCD intensity while we increase the frequency, instead of just one peak in the classic or in the, in the transport measurement, now we see two peaks. We see one at 4.5 and one at 4.9. And that was interesting to us. Um, so because we didn't really expect these spatially inhomogeneous modes uh, in, in, in this geometry. And I just would like to point out that when it I, I don't, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about this, but there's another paper from, from this instrument that we did uh, with, uh, by Santa Pile uh, on permaloid cobalt zinc oxide, where we also discussed these, these uh, spatial inhomogeneity, in, inhomogeneities uh, that are observed when you, when you in spin pumping. And that's, that's, it's something that um, uh, where, where, where you always get, um, where, um, where you can see uh, unexpected behavior. So the reason now that we're asking is, um, that we are asking ourselves, where does this double peak come from? And so for that, uh, it's always good to, to look at simulations. And the one thing that's different from the, lab, from the lab experiment, between the lab experiment and the synchrotron experiment, is that we are actually using much higher microwave fields in the synchrotron experiment. <clears throat> and so in the lab experiment, typically the microwave field is about an Ersted, and then you really only have that one peak at 4.7, 4.8 gigahertz. Um, but in the, in, in the synchrotron, we apply typically a little bit stronger fields, we have a little bit more amplification so that we can see the, uh, 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 we can see the, 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 uh, uh, the, the XMCD a little bit better. And when we do this, we get, uh, even in the simulation, we get nonlinear effects. And these nonlinear effects lead to uh, excitation or to, to these edge modes developing and to a second peak. And so uh, what the simulations gave us is that essentially you do have two peaks. You have one at 4.5 and one at 4.8 gigahertz when you increase that um, uh, uh, the, the uh, microwave frequency. And so this was very interesting to see. And that was very nice to see that we really can distinguish between these linear and nonlinear excitations. And also that, again, being able to see these excitations on the nano scale and what happens when you change uh, frequencies, when you change intensities and so on, that really gives you additional insight into what's going on. And, and uh, this has been published uh, more recently by Jun Ding in, in FISREF research. Okay, so I would like to, um, the last couple of minutes of this talk, uh, used to talk a little bit about spin waves. And this is something where have, we've done a little bit more recently over the last couple of years into um, how can we do, how can we image spin waves in general? The, the, uh, where, where's the behavior of spin waves, spin waves um, in, in confined structures, et cetera. Um, and it's essentially being in, in California, you're always interested in waves because of surfing and so on. Um, but also, I mean, it has become, a, magnetics has become a very important uh, uh, subject in, in magnetism. So, um, and the idea is, can, can we learn something, can we contribute something using our technique? Uh, using this. And so um, the first experiment was, was, um, uh, was a proof of principle experiment where we just wanted to see, can we, can we essentially uh, help to understand what's going on in, 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 in simple nanostructure or microstructures? And uh, there's a, a paper by Banholz a couple of years ago, uh, who's a, um, uh, where they had an fMR measurement of um, little stripes um, that are just one by five micrometer, essentially. And so they did the fMR measurement um, and found that essentially you have lots of different modes there the, uh, that you can see in the, in the measurement. And you can also simulate this with OMF. Um, and so the, the idea here is that depending on what, kind, what direction the field comes from, uh, either parallel to the stripe or perpendicular to the stripe, you have all these different modes developing. And so what we wanted to, what we were setting out is, can we really see these modes? Are, is, this, is this really what happens? So 
<clears throat> we made um, we made a little sample. Um, we made essentially one by five micrometer um, uh, uh, permaloy uh, structures, and uh, we we placed them in a micro resonator. So this is now not in a, 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 a waveguide uh, structure of a Coplanar waveguide. This is also not a um, um, the, the classical uh, FMR setup. It's really like a, a twenty micro a, a little omega. Uh, that's lithographically produced, that's about 20 micrometer in diameter. And so we put our samples in the middle. And so we have a very high local uh, microwave intensity with um, limited bandwidth in that case. So you have to figure out a little bit how to, how to do this. But by doing so, we could uh, nicely corroborate uh, these, uh, these, uh, 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 these um, uh, simulations. Uh, so we see, for example, here, uh, number three, when the field comes from there. So this is where we, so when we applied the field along the, the long side, um, we see this mode, uh, and I apologize for this little defect here, but uh, we, when we have, uh, when we uh, uh, change the field a little bit, we see the, the mode with the five uh, areas, so, so it's a higher mode, and when we apply the field from the, from the side, uh, we essentially also see these modes here, and we can also, and I'm not showing here, we, we certainly see, also see the balance. So, and this is this was very encouraging for us to see because these things are with, uh, these uh, movies were acquired at nine gigahertz, uh, a little bit over nine gigahertz. So that means each of the per periods here is about a hundred nanoseconds, roughly. Um, and we can see this very nicely with our technique. Uh, so that means we essentially have about ten picosecond. Uh, um, uh, we can resolve magnetization dynamics on the ten picosecond time scale, which is very again very encouraging to us because that's again means we, we, uh, we can look at technological relevant uh, things happening. And, and um, also because the upper uh, end of that uh, um, time of our time resolution is much more towards microseconds. So we can really cover a very nice large range of uh, time, uh, zones, uh, time um, scales. Um, so, um, and then our next step was going away from these artificial um, uh, uh, artificial um, um, structures to structures made by bacteria. And this is an area that is uh, very active and has this is also lots of people are looking into this. But essentially the, the idea is that you have, you have magnetic, <coughs> sorry, magnetotactic bacteria, uh, they can actually produce uh, little chains of, of uh, um, uh, magnetic um, uh, nanoparticles with very high accuracy and also with very uh, little deviation from particle to particle. Um, so they can actually do this almost, uh, they, they can do this better than, than humans. Uh, and also it, you can actually program these uh, bacteria using uh, manipulating the DNA into making certain shapes and so on. So, and then the idea is, can we do this? Or uh, one of the dreams is you know, can we do this, do this ever for any kind of magnetic computing, having these little bacteria um, things down. But I, I leave this out there whether this is something that's really realistic, but it's definitely a very nice playing field, um, having uh, very nicely well-defined structures to, to start with and, and, uh, and doing this. And so what we did is here, and Thomas Fegler is, is the, the person who is uh, doing most of the work here. Um, he, uh, he does the micromagnetic uh, simulations uh, of, of these structures, figuring out um, um, where the relative frequencies are, also the regular FMR uh, measurements and so on. And then we take this into our Stixon microscope to do uh, Stixon FMR. So um, I want to show, this is, the, this is the first chain that we worked with, um, um, that is uh, in this case 19 um, magnetite nanoparticles that are about 40, 50 nanometer in size, roughly. Um, and uh, the first thing we did is, or the first thing that, that Thomas did, he, um, uh, took the time and we put took the SAM image uh, and then really um, calculated uh, the uh, the FMR spectrum of the different areas of the chain um, and so we find a very complex spectrum but we can also then uh, if you put this in uh, into um, into a, a highly sensitive FMR setup uh, that they have the University of Duisburg Essen uh, you can actually then also corroborate part of uh, the, these uh, um, theoretically Predicted um, uh, band structure using using your measurements. So that was that was a, a good first step, and that's always very important when you come to the synchrotron with your samples, in particular these uh, very challenging samples, which are rather small, is that they're well characterized. 
pre-calculus. That means you have an idea from uh, calculations what it should be, or you have uh, uh, fMR measurements uh, from your lab so that you know what's going on, and that then then you can uh, go to a certain frequency. And again, we, we for these measurements we went to nine gigahertz, nine point one gigahertz um, in the following. So and. Essentially, what I want to show you here, this is these two images. These are the two sticks and images that we acquired now um, at this uh, at, uh, at this frequency at 6.7 uh, gigahertz with a uh, with a suitable field. Um, where uh, and what what, we, what I'm showing you here is really is the the amplitude of the magnetic oscillation across that chain. And you remember that chain was actually quite long, um, so you can see this up here in the phase distribution. Uh, that's the, in the of the micromagnetic, so that chain essentially goes uh, extends over the entire image here, but we only see an excitation really in the middle. And what's a little bit hard to see, but maybe you can you can uh, get an idea, is that actually the amplitude distribution is much more localized to the center of the chain than the phase distribution. So which means um, we, we and again, I, I apologize, it's a little bit hard to see uh, with, on, the, on this uh, color scale. But essentially, what, what it means is that we can very nicely local um, uh, uh, excite that um, uh, that um, that chain. Of, we can by choosing a certain frequency and a certain um, uh, field, uh, we can excite a, a particular area of, of that chain. And in principle, it should now also be possible by changing field and changing uh, or changing the frequency to go to a different area. Um, and unfortunately, at that time, it wasn't possible because the 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 the, the, the unfortunate thing about X-rays is that sometimes they are we always think they are non-destructive, but they are a little bit destructive. So uh, we reached the point where we couldn't take any more data on this one. So we repeated our measurements on a different chain um, just recently, and for that, actually, we went to uh, the Bessie two microscope. Uh, Bessie two synchrotron in Berlin and collaborated uh, with the uh, with our colleagues over there and that's the last slide I would like to show today um, so we have a different chain here of, of, of particles um, we have the SEM image we took a six image of these particles before we started and uh, also Thomas again did the micromagnetic model and now while we you can what you essentially can see while you change the field going from 200 millitesla down to 108 millitesla, you essentially turn on and off different parts of that, uh, of that chain that's produced by this bacteria. And <clears throat> not only can you turn on and off different parts of the material, uh, in some areas when you, when you look very carefully, you can also see that um, uh, particular, I would say at 168 uh, millitesla here, that different parts of the chain are on and off, but uh, in, at 180 degree phase relation. So it's it's re really nice to see that that you can do this, um, and um, we have to see what what the applications here could be, or how how to take this to the next level, um, or how we can take this maybe uh, again back to an artificial level, um, and uh, for the purpose of doing um, more applied mechanics. Okay, so um, and with that, I'd like to uh, summarize. I hope I stay roughly within time. Um, there is uh, our team here at the Advanced Light Source uh, where I'm now working. And so we everything, all the data I have shown you uh, were acquired either at the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Light Source or at the Bessie a Microscope. Um, as uh, Kirill mentioned at the beginning, uh, I moved to the ALS a couple of years ago. So we have a Stixon microscope here as well. And Thomas and I are currently in the process of putting together, uh, of equipping this with a uh, uh, the magnet and also with the time resolved uh, measurements. Uh, time resolve capability so that we can do all of the, these things here and we should hopefully uh, beginning of next year this will all be available here at the advanced light source so i i invite you if you're interested in this to uh contact us and let us know and so we can think about doing something together um all of the uh, early experiments at the advanced at, at this uh ssl were were done in joe stir's group together with stefano bonetti rupali kokeja and Jao chen and then uh, again, uh, I mentioned this before, we had a very nice uh, collaboration for, for many years now with uh, Andrew Kent's group at New York University, and, but also with the University of Duisburg Essen where Thomas uh, graduated and he's now a postdoc here at the Advanced Law Um in the group of Michael Fahle, um, who, uh, where we have done uh, essentially taking um, or working on all the magnetic stuff and, and the spin injection stuff. Um, I also want to point out that um, uh, some of the work has been done in, in the group of Axel Hoffmann with Jim Jardine, and that um, 
um, that is in particular the spin pumping. Uh, that was one of the things that he drove and he really wanted to do with this microscope. Okay, and with that, I would like to um, thank you, everyone. I just put up this slide here. Um, again, this is uh, 20 years of uh, X-ray diaprism microscopy uh, history, essentially, going from interferometric and ferromagnetic bilayers, spin injection into copper, imaging spin waves, and now going to, I'm, I'm adding, I think 20 years ago, I only had this picture in my slides as a last slide. Now I'm adding and adding and adding, uh, which are kind of what, how I feel um, milestones of X-ray microscopy, at least from my personal view. I mean, there's certain other people have done um, many more interesting and or maybe not interesting, but important things, I don't know. Um, but certainly uh, other people have also contributed uh, significantly to that field. That's These are the things that uh, came out of uh, things that where I participated in. And so now the final step is, or the last step is um, uh, looking at magnetization dynamics in in, diets, uh, in, um, sorry, in bacteria. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Hendrik, for this very interesting talk. Uh, let's use the reactions buttons to thank him. Um, we're ready to take questions. So in Zoom, please use the raise hand uh, feature. If you're watching on Twitch, just type your question in the chat box and I'll read it for you. If you can't, uh, for some reason, turn on your mic in Zoom, you can also um, type your question in, in, in the chat box. So uh, first question, uh, Samir Kurdi, please go ahead. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much, Hedrick, for your talk. Um, so I have a question regarding this bacteria. I'm actually interested in this. Is this, um, what's the magnetic particle inside these, or what, I guess the nanocrystals maybe in, inside these bacteria, is it magnetite? And it's magnetite. If so, if so, then would the spin wave um, generated just follow the magnetite dispersion in these materials? Or is there some sort of shape isotropy that, 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 that changes the magnetic interactions? Um, so can you, can you repeat that? Can you so if it's magnetite, then um, would then is the, was the ferromagnetic resonance that you measured, was that at the frequency expected from the spin wave dispersion for magnetite? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think we, we yeah we went to the frequencies that we uh, predetermined essentially uh, in the in magnetic simulations. Okay, so then those were based on material properties from the actual from magnetite and not anything else. That's uh, okay. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, other questions, please. So let me ask you about this picture that's on the screen right now, actually, this uh, picture number three, where we have this um, localized oh. dissertation. So you mentioned there is the, um, uh, uh, like the P wave-like asymmetry, but it also seems like there's a shift from the position of the excitation. Is that, um, yeah. and is so that significant? Yeah, that's, it is actually significant. And so let me uh, get, get back here to, uh, oh, wait. Um, and so what we found is, and when you, when you look at the distribution of the, um, uh, of the field around this contact, so we have the external field that's going this way. So that's homogeneous everywhere. Uh, and then you have, you have a current coming through that and also you have a, a, a field that comes from the, um, uh, from the cobalt iron spin polarizer underneath. So that is essentially coming out of the plane here and going into the plane over here. So that's adding to that. And the final thing that you have is that you have the Ersted field coming from the current itself that curls around. So what it means essentially, you, you generate a, a field landscape around that uh, contact where the barrier for the spin wave to, ex, uh, ex, um, get go, uh, to, to travel away from the contact is higher on this side than on this side. Um, and so that is essentially, that causes this asymmetry so that you don't have anything going to the, to the bottom, uh, but only going uh, up to the top. So it's, it's essentially, when you, when you look at it, uh, at, at the frequency we are looking at, it's, again, it's, I think it's about six and a half gigahertz or so, um, we, we plotted the FMR resonance frequency and that's, it's everywhere, it's this, it's, um, it's 6.5 gigahertz here in the center. It's uh, 6.5 gigahertz out here, except 
for an area that is essentially kind of going around here and almost closing like 270 degrees. That's where the, where the resonance frequency is changed. And so that means this, whatever spin wave you excite or spin dynamics you excite here, it's not in, there's no resonance condition around the, uh, the contact. It's only going to one direction. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, thanks. And then, um, so there is also this red and blue alternating contrast in the, uh, I think in the entire uh, snapshot here. So when you run it, uh, um, the red turns into blue and backwards throughout the entire uh, frame, right? Yeah. So um, this is some kind of homogeneous uh, oscillation, is it? Yeah, and so we were, I think we never quite fully decided on what's going or never came to a final conclusion of what's going on here. But the way the, the sample is structured, there's actually a large copper. Uh, if, you, if you look at it, there's a large copper electrode on the bottom, a large copper electrode on the, on, the, on the top. So that could be essentially just a homogeneous excitation of that entire structure using these two, using these two electrodes, kind of like in a cavity. OK, I see. OK, thank you. Um, so uh, any other questions, please? Let me ask, also ask you about this uh, bacteria um, demonstrations that you have. So um, do you have any like, speculations about the outlook for this? Like how can this be used um, for, um, you know, are you thinking about assembling some uh, chains with predefined properties or what, what, what's the um, thinking here? Thomas and I talk about this quite regularly. We were very excited at the beginning because essentially you have, you have the ability to, to tell the, these bacteria how to assemble themselves just by changing the DNA and they can actually do this, which is very nice. But on the other hand, um, I, I think it, it will probably remain a nice playing ground for that purpose. But imagining to program just a thousand or a hundred bacteria to do exactly the same then arrange them it's probably not going to work um i would say if there's again it's it's a very nice playing field it's it's a very nice proof of principle system where you can just do something with one chain uh, and again this is probably where all these nano uh, characterization tools that we have uh come in uh, very handy because you can then see what's going on um but Go, taking this any further could be tricky. So we are also now looking into um, possibilities to um, to essentially make our own little nano chains and and uh, putting them down. It seems to be much more uh, scalable, at least at least to a somewhat larger. Mm -hmm. uh, Is there any way to manipulate the configuration of uh, of those chains through electromagnetic forces somehow? Yeah, so that's actually a good point. Um, so we saw that it's also very easy to manipulate with x-rays um, because you can just essentially destroy them. So there must be, that, that, that's actually a very good point. Um, with, they are, it turns out they are usually very loosely bond, bonded to their substrate. Um, so yes, I think that, that would be nice. I think that, yeah, that's something we should look into. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. It looks like, where are the questions? Uh, unless anyone doesn't know how to click raise hand, so shoot me a message in the chat quickly if that's the case. Otherwise, let's thank uh, Hendrik again for this very interesting talk. And we're gonna stop the recording and streaming now. But if you would like to uh, continue the discussion, please stay and turn on your camera. <laughs>